Hi, Marina. Welcome to the Create Podcast. I am so, so thrilled to be getting to know you today. I've heard so many amazing things about you, and I know that we both share the love of art, the love of pink, and Pomeranian. So, <laughs> yes, thank you so much for having me here today. I'm so excited to be on your podcast. Super excited. Well, I guess we'll, let's start from the beginning. I know that you are an art advisor and you support artists. You offer some incredible tips, even just on Instagram. I feel like you offer so much value to the art community. How did you know you wanted to become an art advisor? What was that path like? Cause I'm sure it wasn't, um, direct, you know, <laughs> you weren't born wanting, but I think we all just find like our little, um, niche in the art market. And how did you get here? Yeah, so that's it. Thank you for asking that question. I it's my favorite part of this whole thing to just like explain my journey because it really puts everything into perspective. So I work with artists and I was working in the New York City art world since 2004, right? Which is a really long time. Um, when I started this company, I had already been working in galleries for 15 years. I was a gallery director for a long time. And while I worked with really amazing people, I also found that I worked with people that would consistently give artists a runaround. And I saw this consistently in the art world. I was so uh, hurt by that because my favorite people in the art world were artists. I thought, well, you know, without them, what is the art world, right? Uh, and so I took this leap in 2018 to start a company that helps artists navigate the art world. So it's called the Artist Advisory. And what I do is essentially I'm kind of like a guidance counselor for the art world. I love that. I love that so much. Thank you so much for sharing that. And Tell me, can you give us an example? What does, when you, when you say artists were getting the runaround, what does that look like? What, what, are, what are some examples of that? That's a great question. Um, for example, I would consistently, uh, for a long time, I would sit in, in like in the front of the gallery and because I would recognize the collectors who would come in. So that was like, part of big part of my job. And so when I was sitting there, a lot of artists would come in and say, Hey, I want to show here. Like, how can I show my work here? And I worked, you know, in these huge galleries, they did art uh, fairs, like um, art Miami, art Basel. And they just, you know, a, I was taught to say, okay, well, we're not accepting submissions at this time. And these artists would like still just not understand how to get in. And I guess I'm being a little like circulatory. It was just so frustrating for me to see artists try to submit to galleries. They would send in their work, they would send in their catalogs, spend that they spent a lot of money on and nothing would happen, you know? Um, and that was like a really big part of me seeing artists getting the runaround. And another huge thing was even, you know, this is like our sacred space. I'm sure there are really cool artists listening to this. Um, but I got to say, some people I worked with would, I'm like scared to say it because it's so, um, I kept it inside for so long. I didn't want to like, I let it out, just let it out. <laughs> okay. I worked with an artist who flew in from Portugal for his solo show. Okay. And this was a huge show. As a matter of fact, a major network came and filmed it for a documentary as well. He was a huge artist and the gallery owner said, I don't want to deal with this artist. I know it's like a big, and if they're listening, they know who they are. Oh my God. But I, that was really a huge turning point for me because the gallery owner did not take the artist out for dinner after this opening that the artist flew in to New York from Portugal for. And I wasn't even 
um, like allowed to take the artist to dinner. I mean, I could have done it, I guess, on my dime, but it was a huge thing. And I thought, wait a minute, this is, this is a gallery owner who is supposed to really like care about these artists, right? And he didn't. And uh, a few years later, I, I just couldn't do it anymore. I am really, really bad at lying and keeping secrets, I guess. Um, so here we are. Oh my gosh. What? That must have been so hard to watch. So it must have been so hard to see and not be able to do anything about it. Um, that is disrespectful because, that, you know, it's a two part relationship the gallery and the artist or the gallery and the dealer, it's, we have to work together. And so what were some, I guess that helped you establish some of your values as a business owner. What are some of the values that you really want to stick to when it comes to working with artists or, or when you coach artists to stand up for themselves? Yeah. So, you know, I think it's, um, I'm going to just go back for a moment and say, like, I did mention that I was really bad at lying. And yes, I'm terrible at lying, but I'm not that bad at keeping secrets. So one of the biggest um, ways that I work with artists is I keep all of their uh, information confidential as much as they want to keep it confidential. When I work with artists, I make sure I listen to them. I think that their intention behind their work is the most important thing. And uh, one thing that I definitely would never ever do is tell an artist what to make, right? I don't think that is part of you know, who I am. And this is something that I saw when I was working in galleries. Uh, sometimes the market would drive the artwork and it would fizzle out. So for example, there were uh, gallery owners who would suggest to artists to make a certain type of artwork because it would sell more and it would be easier to sell. And then there would be an oversaturation of that artwork and the artists didn't have the time to fully creatively develop their body of work and they would reach a dead end. So for this reason, I never tell artists what to make. Yeah. My God, I'm so sorry to, that you had to witness that. And I think, you know, I've, I have never experienced directly, but it does like whenever you hear like, oh, you should do this, or even like the implication of something. It's interesting to think that is such a short sighted action to, to tell someone to do that, because then you're not thinking about the longevity of one, your own relationship with them and how it could potentially blossom into something more. And two, of course, your own business too, because you're the one selling it and eventually it's going to run out. So that is, you know, very short sighted. And it's interesting to think about that from, from a, a bigger perspective. So what would you say, you know, what are some things that you think are appropriate for a gallery or a dealer, or even an advisor to share with an artist? Like, what would you think, what are helpful things that support and inspire them and don't um, hinder their own development? <laughs> so I think it's important. Uh, I just want to make it clear. I don't ever sell the artwork of the artists that I work with. So I'm an artist advisor only. And I think that as an artist advisor, I know you are as well, right? Um, I think it's super important for us to step into the role of seeing the work from a larger context and being able to organize the work as well. Because an artist is so closely emotionally connected to the work that they make. So one of the biggest roles that I think, you know, I step into is helping artists organize their work and present it properly so that they're fully understood online with a really good website, with their social media presence. And most importantly, I help them understand who to work with in the art world, because while I've had these really uh, weird experiences, right? Like what, while I've witnessed such weird um, interactions, kind of negative interactions with artists, I've also seen 
really amazing interactions between the gallery owners and artists, collectors and artists. And I fully believe that one of the biggest benefits to working with an artist advisor, and this is something that I'm really, really um, interested in doing, is guiding artists to not get into these situations with people who are not going to make them feel good. Yeah, that's really good advice. Yeah, because there's enough room for all types of art. So, and I have personally experienced the dark side of art advice, like art coaching on my end. Um, one of probably the most traumatic things that I've ever gone through is having someone tell me what not to do or tell me that what I'm passionate about is invalid. It can really scar you and it could really it could really harm your self-esteem and the way that you show up because you, if you constantly have that voice in the back of your mind saying pink is not, <laughs> I have actually heard pink paintings don't sell <laughs> or, you know, don't paint bedrooms. And it was funny because years oh, after oh I know <laughs> looking oh. around. Um, yeah. I know like on this side, it's, it's all so pink. funny that side it's all pink but also every single artwork in here has pink in it I'm going to show you some um I have this beautiful work by Rachel Morrissey pink okay and then I know we're doing like um it's found only in some cases but if you're watching the video pink these are by uh Margaret Jolly right and then there's beautiful that is beautiful and are all pink. And you know what? I think pink sells. What do you think? I think I buy a lot of pink to know that it definitely does. <laughs> I mean, like, seriously. <laughs> and it's funny because the, the person was trying to be helpful from their very limited perspective. And in their case, they might never buy pink because they hate it. But that doesn't mean that that's true for everyone. And, you know, I heard other things like don't paint bedrooms, paint like flowers and trees, which I love flowers and trees and I want to paint them, but not because they sell because I have a passion or a message or something I'm trying to do with it. Um, so it's very interesting hearing these stories. And so what would you say, I know you mentioned you help artists by strengthening their presentation, getting organized, having a strong website, social media. What would you say were the main tips that you Oh, you find yourself sharing with artists that will help them elevate their image and sh show up more professionally. What would you say those things are? Yeah, so um, it's hard to kind of put, put to make this a very concise answer, but I'm going to do my best here because there are so many things that I work with artists on. Uh, I also work with artists in mindset. And this is one of the most important things so that you have the confidence not to uh, make decisions out of fear, right? And I think um, a lot of the time uh, you can identify, you know, whoever you're working with, if they are driving whatever they're doing out of fear or trying to make you make a decision based out of fear, you don't want to do that. Um, but so that's a huge, huge step. I would say never make decisions out of fear. Um, but on the more kind of, mm, you know, I want to say like the super practical side of things, uh, a lot of artists feel like they might be doing so many different things and they don't know how to present their work cohesively. And similarly, uh, I hear from curators when they go onto artist websites or you know, their Instagrams, they might feel like they don't have direction of how to look at the work. Here's the way that I combat this and I help artists understand exactly how to be understood. I think that you have an intention based on why you make the work, what sort of qualifies you to make the work based on your experience, uh, based maybe on your identity. And also that would encompass all the different things that you do. So the big thing that I work with on artists is their intention, figuring out what it is that drives them to do the work so that they can authentically connect to an audience that truly understands and truly cares about their work. So 
huge tip, always think about what it is that drives you to make the work. And when somebody asks you what you do, right, as an artist, tell them why you do it first, because they're going to remember it so much more. They're going to connect to the story behind it. Love that tip. That's beautiful. I think, yeah, intentionality will help also prevent comparisonitis because that way we're not like, oh, who's this person? Should I be posting this? Should I have six TikToks done today? And instead just like asking, what is the purpose of what I'm doing? What is the purpose of my work? I love that. Thank you for that beautiful reminder. It's so easy to get this. I mean, even, you know, being an artist, but also being a coach, I even find, (laughs) obviously we're coaching ourselves all the time too, but I find myself too, going down those spirals and just snapping back and coming back to that intention and purpose is is the the remedy to everything pretty much in life, right? (laughs) Totally. And, um, you know, back to comparisonitis for a moment, you know, what's funny is there's an Uber and there's a Lyft, right? (laughs) And we don't think that (laughs) we would never think like two companies are like, really, you know, one is not going to succeed without the other. And one of the biggest things about comparisonitis is it's rooted in this idea that there's not enough to go around, right? We know there is enough to go around. And as a matter of fact, if there is an artist who you feel aligned with, you should share their work and your stories. You should tag them. You should uplift them because guess what? there's enough room on these collectors walls for both of your work. And if the themes are aligned, if the work is aligned, why not? Right? Like, why not? So true. So true. It's so funny. One of my collectors has, I have a friend and she also paints interiors, but she's very different. And her name is Erica Sterling. And it's funny because one day I got a message from someone that said, oh my gosh, there's an artist that also paints interiors. Did you know that? And I was like, yes. And we showed together because there is enough room and there's actually like a lot of room for a topic to be explored by many different people. So it was so funny because this person was very worried <laughs> that I was going to get upset. I was like, girl, like we've already shown together, (laughs) like we share pictures. I haven't actually chatted with her in a few years, but we used to like ask each other, where do you get your references from? And it was just such a funny thing. And it's so true. And some of my collectors have both of our work too. So it's such a good point. And then it always makes me like laugh slash cringe when artists are like, she's copying me, she's copying me, you know, and it's not, not even the same. (laughs) So everyone, there's just so much space for all of our creations as long as they're ethical and obviously not stolen (laughs) yeah and you know I gotta say was that pun intended there's a lot of room for amazing um oh I'll edit this part out can you hear me yeah um and I gotta say you know was that a pun because there is a lot of room for interiors (laughs) now it is (laughs) I love that. I'm going to have to make that like my Instagram bio. <laughs> I like cannot resist a dad joke. You know what I mean? Like I just, yeah. <laughs> it's so cute. I love it. I love that. <laughs> oh, I'm going to use that one. Oh my gosh. Amazing. Well, Marina, what are you currently working on? What's lighting you up at this moment of your life? I know you're always, you were just traveling. I was seeing, I was jealous. I was seeing your photos. I was like, I cannot wait to get out again. Um, what have you been up to? Oh my gosh, that was so much fun. I actually, I went down to Miami for a few days to participate in the super fine art fair. Um, They invited me to do a comfort corner for artists. So I spoke to the artists and uh, the fair unfortunately did have to end a little bit early because of the weather, but it was successful nonetheless. Right now I am working on uh, my and developing even further. And I'm working on enrolling the 10th round of my signature online group program for artists of all levels on how to navigate the art world. It's called the Artist Academy. And it's just something I'm so excited to present for the 10th time in a row. So cool.
That's amazing. Congratulations. It's always awesome to launch our courses. It's like the best thing, like, well, the best part is like welcoming everyone in and seeing all those beautiful new faces. So that's amazing. And where can people learn? Is there a website? Um, I'll include it in the show notes. Oh, thank you so much. So uh, the website is theartistadvisory.com forward slash May 2022. Uh, So learn about it there. Yay. Yeah. And this episode will come out. When is the deadline to enroll? The deadline to enroll will be the end of April, I believe, or maybe the first week of May. Perhaps. Okay. Well, it will be out before then. <laughs> so people can still join in when they're listening to this episode. That's amazing. And what is your, I know you share so much wisdom on your Instagram. How can people follow you on there? Can you share um, that with us as well? Sure. Yeah. So on Instagram, uh, you can find me at the underscore artist underscore advisory. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for sharing this beautiful encouragement and wisdom. You have such a beautiful energy and I'm just excited to keep connecting with you and learning more about you. And, um, I think our, our coaches, art advisors must unite (laughs) and, uh, stay together and artists too, of course, you know. We're all artists. Everyone, everything's an art. <laughs> also, I have to congratulate you on your certification through uh, for NLP, right? Yes, yes. Thank you on Yes Supply. It was amazing. It was such a commitment. I haven't been in school in a while, and like having a night class was like a new thing. <laughs> I was like, how did I do this before? <laughs> but I did it, and I was so so. It's such a powerful um, tool to use with our clients. Yes, I um, often use EFT tapping with my clients. It is such a a huge help. It's helped me so much um, as well. So amazing. Yeah, me too. When I used to work at Macy's and I would get anxiety before my shift, I would just, (laughs) I would tap and I didn't know what I was doing, but I found this, I found Brad Yates on YouTube and it's like the only thing that ever helped me other than taking like a shot, which I don't do. (laughs) I don't drink anymore. Like, so, um, it was, uh, the only powerful thing. So everyone who has anxiety or any kind of emotional things coming up, EFT tapping is the best thing ever. So good. Ever. Totally. But thank you so much, Marino. Such a pleasure having you on the show. And I'm so excited to see what you create next. Thank you so much, Ekaterina. Love it. Thank you. Thank you so much.